You didn't know? Um, thank you so much. Uh, you know what's interesting? I was sitting there uh, and listening. Hey, Dan. Uh, and I realized, Jesus, it's fucking crazy that I can literally give this entire keynote in about one minute, given the context that was just created, and I think it's just gonna make sense to everybody, right? Which is, everything you've just heard is 100% mathematically correct. The reason they spent a lot of money on that fucking rat ass video that you saw is 100% correct. And the reality is, is the only reason that I'm standing here whatsoever and being, you know, feeling good about who's watching me because so many of you guys are doing your thing out there is that I just respect the fuck out of both of them. And I just genuinely believe the rest of this room doesn't. That either it's 5149 or some of you are 100% math. Uh, the world I now live in, these big agencies, they're 100% art. It's, you know, they have no respect to sales. And, and that's it, like, I literally feel like leaving. Thank you. Like, that's literally, like, but, but, it's, but it's interesting that that's really it. Like, honestly, there's a lot of my energy and I have a lot of time that I, and I know a lot of you, and, and really I'll talk for the next 20 minutes out of the respect that I'm sure a lot of you don't know who I am or context, but I'd much rather get into the Q&A part and just answer the detailed shit that's on your mind because the theory is simple. Like, it's just the same old shit. It's math and art. And you better deploy it. Where, and then the thing that I think I've done well, I guess there's the thing that I should probably actually now spend some time on is, why was I in Seattle yesterday doing, so the amount of free days I have in my career now are non-existent, right? I don't, I don't speak for free. Everything's about the businesses that I run. I don't like leisure. So like there's no free days, right? Like, like everything is calculated. I do things for a reason. Uh, why the fuck was I in Seattle yesterday spending a free day, which is a rarity for me? It was because I was talking about what I've done, but mainly I was trying to extract value from an incubator in Seattle run by tech stars around the voice space. These are people that are building businesses and apps on top of Alexa and Google Home and things of that nature. I think the thing, you know, actually it's, this is pretty funny, this, since I'm so improv out, I'm starting to realize, huh, I've always thought that I respected, you know, I literally just two minutes ago said, I just respect the art and the science better. I don't think I'm really, or nor have I ever really been better or really that good at others. And I would actually probably argue now that I'm thinking there's plenty of people that somewhat respect both. I think the thing that actually in a lot of ways has worked for me that I'd like to talk to you about because I actually think if I think about how much I respect everybody in the room, the thing that maybe I can bring you the most value on is why do I bet on things that tend to work out well it's mainly because I'm willing to lose money in the short term. I think that I'm willing to waste time and lose money much more than most people because I'm patient as fuck even though my energy is frantic, right? I know for fact that whoever has the best Alexa skill in this room is gonna make a fortune in seven years. I'm wasting money and time trying to be that person in this room. And so I think the other variable that you want to leave this talk from besides if you only believe in the creative or if you only believe in the math, how do you squeeze those two together? It's can you allocate an additional 20% of your time and money and mental energy to start betting on where we're going instead of where we are right now? A lot of you are winning because we're playing in where we are right now while all those fuckers are playing in 2009. The question is, are you willing to waste money while you're making money right now, being right, on 2021? That is what has kept me consistent. I had an email newsletter in 1996 that had 91% open rates. I didn't want social media. Like, if I was making content back in the day, you would have seen me sad as fuck about social media. I didn't want to learn Twitter. I didn't want to learn Tumblr. I didn't want to. Like I had email and you know, SEM and SEO figured out. I was good. It was probably the laziest part of my career because it just worked. But I recognize that the thing that got me here is never the thing that's gonna take me to the next place. And I think we rest on our laurels when we've figured shit out. And so I'm spending an ungodly amount of time on everything that isn't the math. It's incredible that we now live in a world where 
the people that are building great companies in this and they do great and they make a lot of money, they deserve it because they take things that we don't have to worry about out of the equation. And the fact of the matter is math will always be that one. The quant part of our worlds is always the thing that's gonna be scalable and then commoditizable. The things that aren't are the art, the creativity, um, and most importantly, the intuition and then the audacity to leave money on the table every single day of your life to invest in the world that you think is gonna be there in 24 months, and then you have to be right, otherwise you lose. And so to me it's very clear, it's a little bit of a left field conversation, and it has nothing to do with me being there yesterday, you need to get very serious about sound. Because let me tell you something about why what they make is successful. We care about only a couple things as people. Money, health, religion. There's not a lot of things we really, really give a fuck about, but one of the things that we care about and always have, but now we're at an all-time high, is time. Uber became a huge company by selling time, not transportation. Time is imperative. We don't like friction. We don't like friction on our landing pages and we don't like friction in our lives. And everybody, even when they don't have a lot of money, spend a lot of money on convenience. Convenience is king, time matters. And I'm gonna tell you right now, and you'll think back to this talk one way or the other. You're gonna think back to this talk because this was the talk that made you get very serious about investing into audio or you'll think back to it when other people are making real money, real opportunities, changing the world, whatever they wanna do with the attention, and you'll think about, you wish you started earlier. And I lived this whole life with social, right? And it's, it's fun for me because it's just black and white and obvious. So we're gonna all be invested and in winning on time, uh, excuse me, on audio, because it saves us time. Audio saves you time. Every single person in this room, when brushing their teeth, in four years, will be listening to some sort of voice telling them what they're doing that day, what the weather is, where they're going, what's happening. It's just gonna be that. And if you're smart, you can penetrate somebody's first seven minutes every single day of their lives and talk about whatever the hell you want them to know about. And so, I would give that a ton of thought. You know, obviously, between you and me, I'm sure a lot of you have seen it, I, I, it's not even close to too late to start a podcast. Podcasts are imperatively important because people, you know, the way we roll now is we can listen and do something else. It's hard to watch one of my videos and do something else. It's super easy to listen to what I'm talking about and do something else. Anything that aligns you with the end consumer's time is an imperatively big advantage for you. And listen, there's a lot of people that are comedians and, and you know, actors and actresses and things of that nature. You gotta figure out how you mold in into these new platforms, you gotta figure it out, but it's coming, and so, to me, the big things to really think about is pairing art and science together, and then really recognizing the consumer behavior, because we're in the later innings of social. Like, we're in mature platforms, which means really good things for Facebook stock, you know? but doesn't mean as much for a lot of us. I mean, I'm looking at somebody in the crowd right now and I'm like smiling the whole time because we sat in an old Vayner office and I was like, guys, this Vine thing, I'm telling you, and I got them all together, all of them, and I was like, I'm telling you, it's like, you're, like I remember telling them, you're all gonna be famous in a year, and I remember looking at them and some maybe, it, it was just so obvious. It was obvious to me because I saw Twitter before that and YouTube before that, and it just, it's the same, guys, it's the same shit. It's the same shit over and over. There's underpriced attention and there's overpriced attention. There's headline readers and there's practitioners. Let me, let me give you an example of headline reading versus practitioners. Headline readers, Snapchat's dead. Practitioners, holy fuck, Snapchat's ad product is so underpriced because everybody thinks it's dead that it's $2.80 CPM to get in front of everybody who's under 30 in the world, and at least in the US world and a couple other countries, and holy shit, the swipe up conversions of these people since they live in that world are so fucking incredible. There's no platform on earth, not YouTube and Facebook combined that can get somebody under 30 to watch a three minute video continuously, even remotely close to Snapchat, and it's two fucking dollars and 80 cents a CPM. Practitioners versus headline readers. And this is a pretty fucking legit audience, and I know a lot of you, and I watch a lot of everything, 
and just a lot of people who headline read. There's a whole lot of people who have a whole lot of opinions about a whole lot of shit in here and they've never done that thing. Thank you, mom. <laughs> so that's it, man. Like, honestly, it's just gonna be the same shit. I'm gonna sit here fucking at 74 years old and I'm gonna be like, you know, VR fuck faces, like how do, you know, like, you know, it's just the same shit. Like, I, I really feel like I'm done. Like, I'd love to go into q and I don't know where the runners are. Like, you know, I'll tell you anything you wanna know. Like, I, I, LinkedIn's super, super, super interesting to me right now just because the bira- they're, they're really desperate to become the B2B Facebook, so they're seducing the algorithms to try to big the outcomes. Always pay attention to who's desperate. Always pay attention to who's desperate, right? That's always where the opportunity, me. I'm impossible, I'm expensive, I have a book coming out, I whore myself out. That's when you get me, right? Like that's how you get me. It's just not super complex, yeah, it's how you got me. Like it's easy, Um, it's easy. Snapchat, not so much momentum, pay attention. Always, always, always look to the other direction of the conventional wisdom because that's always where the fucking magic is. Understand that if you're the best math, math oriented person in this room, that you're vulnerable to the art. If you're just a creative, bad news, math matters, find somebody, right? That's what this is. And and it's been this for the last 20 years and it's gonna keep going, but I will say the big white space for the collective is sound. What is your podcast? What is your Alexa briefing? Like what do you say to everybody for the first 30 seconds in the world and how do you use your enormous attention on Instagram to get 100,000 people to download it and then it's early so Amazon's like who the fuck is this person and they fly you out, now you're starting in the commercial, it's the same patterns my friends, it's the same patterns. And then ultimately overlaying everything I'm talking about, does your mouth match your ambition? There's a whole lot of billionaires in here, out their mouth, but they go to every fucking concert on earth. And that's cool, like fuck, make 40,000. It's not about the money, it's about do your actions match your ambitions. So that's the framework. And then the last thing you gotta figure out is what you want in your work-life balance and your legacy and how much money you want and what you wanna do with that money. And a lot of people get caught in a rat race. At the most basic level, followers and likes, which is fucking ludicrous, at the next level, which is pretty fucking ludicrous too, money. Without realizing you wake up and you're 47, you're like, fuck, I didn't, you know? So, two frameworks. The things I've just talked about, very easy to understand. Second part, this last minute, a little harder. You gotta get real into self-awareness. But once you know what the fuck you're about, it's ironic and intriguing how the shit just starts happening. Not because you fucking thought it into reality, it's because you know what the fuck you're doing and all your actions map to that reality. Cool, thank you. How many, how many mics do you have? Two, three, great, awesome. Let's go, you guys are in control, I don't wanna get, I don't wanna have feelings. JR? What's up, uh, Gary how are you? thanks for being here. Thanks brother. Um, my name's JR with Digital Marketing Hacks and my question is, I know you, you say that it's gonna end all with uh, robots killing everybody. I hope so. But um, until then, yes. what role do you think AI, artificial Huge. intelligence, and robots have Huge. and are going to have in the next five years in the marketing and digital marketing space? Huge. Even in the 15 minutes that I've gotten a better taste of what these characters are up to, they're going to love it. Like The math people are going to love it because machine learning and AI just do shit that we shouldn't be doing. Like It's just efficiency. It's going to have an enormous thing. Like. But the good news is like, there's so much that we still can do. And, and so basically how I think about you know, ML and AI back at the pad is get me to fucking third and a half base and I'll take care of the rest. And whatever AI can do for that, cool. And whatever low priced employees can do, cool. But like everybody is spending way too much money to get to third and a half base and then the magic is the last part. So that's what AI is gonna mean for everybody here. There's a lot of dumb shit that people have assistants for or managers for that's nonsense. Zero value that the biggest AI companies in the world are gonna get their nut off on. Yeah, hey. Hey, it's, uh, it's really exciting to be here in Thank this you. room with you and everyone here. This is awesome. Appreciate it. Yeah, um, I'm really, experiences that help people save time yes. are awesome. And I'm really interested in experiences that are time bending and um, help people just lose time. 
and I'm interested in creating the like most... Like hardcore drugs? Or? No, no, no. So here we go. The world's most connective music festival. Okay. All right? Where festival goers are connecting with each other like never before. Yep. And with the artists and the artists with their fans. Okay. And so in 2021... You're talking in, VR now? I'm talking about um, the... Uh, Mixed reality? So 2021... Go ahead. Music festivals, connection, the best time of people's lives... What do you see happening in the context of music festivals that you're excited about and that you're excited about creating? So, uh, if I dissect that right, a couple things. One thing I'm super fascinated by that I would have never seen, and I, by the way, I never spend any time predicting, like, like voice, I'm not predicting shit, it's happening, right? What, what I think I'm good at is like recognizing when, there's, when it's practical and then going pot committed, right? Which means you'll lose money for a couple years and then get it. You don't lose for seven years and never get there. The thing that's been super fascinating to me that I would never thought, which is, fuck, social media is making people do more shit in real life. Like, literally some dude is hiking right now just for the fucking Instagram photo. <laughs> right? So, so, what's been amazing about music festivals is because everybody here now is not only themselves, but they're the PR agent of themselves for what they're putting out. People are going to more concerts than ever because of that whole dynamic. I think what you're alluding to is kind of like what's gonna happen in society, like in general, like mixed reality, things of that nature. It's, you know, it's gonna be funny. Technology is making music, you know, going to music grow, and then it's gonna take it away. But I don't think it's as soon as 2021, but I think that right now, a lot of music festivals are failing because they all have the same bullshit acts and it's just supply and demand. And so when you were first four or five, six years ago, you win, and now there's 87 micro festivals and big companies sign the same 13 artists and their shit, right? So I think there's a huge white space for the next generation of that, like the people that the streets fuck with, right? Um, and, then, uh, and then I think that ultimately it's gonna be really interesting in just in general what happens when we live in a mixed reality world. I think the big arbitrage, the only thing that's gonna break the internet is VR. But VR's quite a ways away. Like nobody here spends an hour on VR in a month in real life. So we're a long, like it takes time. Behavior takes time. But eventually when we're switching between completely virtual, like I don't even see you guys right now, my contact lenses have me in Afghanistan. Switch it off, I'm right here. Switch it off and it's AR and Santa Claus is sitting right there. You know, Santa. You know. That world, I think, is super interesting and is going to change all our businesses. Thanks, man. Cool. Yep. Hey, Sean. Uh, <clears throat> Gary, uh, you just came back from August, and you said, I'm bringing YouTube fire. New shows are coming out. Yep. And you took the Ask Gary V show to Facebook only. I did. So what are your latest strategies and why for both YouTube and Facebook? I think you have to make content that is native to the platform you put it out on. I've always thought about that. I fucking wrote a book called Jabs and Jabber Hook five years ago on this. I wasn't doing that. So now that Ask Gary V show is on Facebook Watch and the Daily V is on YouTube, when DRock is wherever the fuck, DRock? Hey, <laughs> you know, now I could say, what's up YouTube? Whereas I couldn't do that before and those little nuances fucking matter. In, you know, all the action is in those little edges. And so I broke them up mainly because of Facebook video. Now that there's watch, I'm fascinated. Any of you watch a show yet on Facebook watch? Just raise your hands, just curious. Higher. Right, so this intrigues me. Like, everybody here has to watch one. Not because, like, I don't watch shit. I'm not, I watched one, the LeVar, the Ball family, because I just wanna see what the fuck they're doing. Like to me, this is the most interesting thing that I'm doing that the good market isn't. You've gotta taste everything. Like if you wanna win, and fuck, there's no way you're in fucking Boise, Idaho if you don't wanna win right now. <laughs> no, I mean that. Like, like, like when I think about who's here, I'm like fuck, these people are hungry. So like to me, 19 hands, which means maybe 31 because people get shy, to two weeks into Facebook Watch that haven't watched, that's, that's, that's it. That's, that's where I play. That's my margin. So that's why I did it, because I wanted to make them native. I have two active shows. I needed to do something on Facebook. And because I watched Facebook, actually, fuck it, I'll tell you. It's not fully announced yet, but we'll see how this goes. Um, <laughs> 
because I watched Watch, and I watched it for four, you know, kind of like four days in a row, looked, I understood what the fuck they were doing, so I sent them an email, I pitched them a show, and they bought it, right? So now I'll have kind of anybody can put a show on Facebook, right, like a page, a watch page, which everybody should be doing here. I'll have my YouTube you know, show, and now I'm gonna have a produced by Facebook show that's gonna get big, dig even more. Listen, man, I talk and like do it and hustle and all this. I just, like, I do so much more than I talk, which is fucking crazy, because my mouth is always running, but I'm just doing. I'm doing, 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 because I'm tasting, I'm tasting. I never think I'm fancy. So many people in here, and I know you, like so many people here make it a little bit and get fancy. Stop, stop doing the shit that got them there. That's the minute you're fucking dead. You got it. Hey Marshall. I, uh, I have a question. It's, yeah. I, there's a guy I follow online, you might have heard of him, his name's Gary Vaynerchuk. Yes. And he told me to push all in on whatever it is that you're good at. So yes. I'm making this big push as Marshall Live. I'm going to everything live, like straight to ask me questions. I love that aspect of your brand. So the question is if everything's moving to voice, is live streaming podcast going to be end up being bigger than say iTunes or a recording that you can come back to? So first of all, you said something interesting that we all do. If everything's moving to voice, nothing moves, to, nothing is everything. Like, we will always have the written word. You could have a, do you know how much virality there is through long form written Facebook and Instagram posts? Like, if you sit in here and you can write, write long ass posts on Facebook and Instagram and watch what the fuck happens. We are humans, we've been around a long fucking time, bro. Marshall, written word, audio, video. Shit is locked in. Got it? So, it's not like you're gonna lose it, like, fuck, if you're great at smoke signals, get the fuck up there, you know? Like, you know, like, shh, communication doesn't change. The, the, the pillars of communication are set. Where we communicate changes, right? And then you have to be contextual, right? Some people are incredible at making a six second video. I keep looking at them because it's fun to see them. I haven't seen them in a while. Others aren't. Like, I can't put two fucking sentences together in my life. I have five New York Times bestselling books because I have a ghostwriter. Because I didn't try to become a great writer when the blogging thing happened because I bet on my strengths. And so I, I do believe that everybody here should bet on their strengths and surround themselves with their weaknesses. I actually think back to, uh, Earlier question, I think AI and machine learning is gonna help a lot of us in here who are creative close the gap on a lot of our weaknesses, which is gonna be really awesome. You got it. Yo. Yep. Um, so Kevin. I think, uh, it's Kevin, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I think a lot of people in here, um, using ClickFunnels or not, have kind of come into a lot more money than maybe they've ever been used to making. Okay. Um, and in one of your previous sentences you said, yeah, you only care about money and all of a sudden you're 47, but then you didn't finish your sentence. Um, I was hoping to like hear you elaborate on sure. that. I, you know, for, I'm sure a lot of people here real, who, let's say, have come into money, it's not as great as advertised for a lot of people. Some people love it. They like watches and Lambos and houses and that's fucking rad, like Mazel Tov. Uh, you know, <laughs> other people don't and you start questioning what the fuck, right? Because when, you're, when you've got nothing and you're on the come up and you've got numbers in your head, whether it's a million or five or three or whatever the fuck it is, it's fucking empty when you get there for a lot of people. And so, you know, I'm just, I'm just trying to make sure people are being thoughtful. They're just, much like what I just said to Marshall, like, life is pretty simple. Like, people play on legacy, on family, on money. Like, there's just a couple pillars. I just think in our space right now, you know, and I know a lot of you have heard me rant on this, I do think entrepreneurship has taken a turn towards club promotion, like, you know, and like, that's just dangerous. Not, it's just dangerous for the people that are gonna, it's not, I don't give a fuck. It's, it's dangerous because people don't realize they need to build a business, not a perception that they're good at business. <laughs> I don't know, you know. Because nobody's, you know, when the market crashes, nobody's, go into Vegas with you when you work at Bank of fucking America. You know, I'm just trying to get people to be more thoughtful. Sure. Hey, hey man. How you doing? I'm super well. Awesome. So, Russell and you are two of 
last year, I uh, was selling websites, was getting really frustrated that yep. I wasn't helping people, felt like they weren't growing their sales, but they had a really nice site. So you guys inspired me to start a podcast. Awesome. Didn't know exactly what for, but just... You're like, fuck it, those guys are doing it, I will too? <laughs> More along the lines of, I was listening to a podcast in the gym, host asked the other guy, what would you tell your 20-year-old self? And the guy answered, I would divorce my wife earlier. <laughs> I was super pissed off. I'm married with two young kids and wanted to have a podcast from a different perspective. And so a year later, thank God, two weeks ago, I got to publish my interview with Russell. I've had Dean Graziosi. And so my question is, number one is, how do you grow even further? And number two is, not just for me, but anybody starting or in progress, what should your priorities be? So let's sit here. You know, both, both of those things I can't answer because you need to decide, you know, what, first of all, you have to define growing for me. Is growing being a top 50 so, podcast? I mean, like, we all get into our micro games. And by the way, I think micro games are good. You know, little short goals, micro, it, it's kind of good. You scratch it, it's fun for a little bit. I think you gotta have your macro point of view, like if, you were, if you're telling me the truth that you felt like the conversations were going in the wrong directions and you wanted to go a different place, well the answer to your question is just do it every day until you're dead, okay. right? Like that's my plan. My plan is, you know, hopefully it gets me to like this one little funny weird thing that I wanna buy a football team, but other than that, <laughs> my plan is to put out shit for free that is historically correct so that people, so I can continue to live the life I'm living which is I made the money I wanted to make a long time ago, but getting 50, 60, 70 emails, 80 emails a day of people like, fuck, you helped me, like that's just like intoxicating, but that's what gets me off, and I, and by the way, I'm not sure that, like, you know, like, I understand why that wouldn't be meaningful to somebody else, like, so you just have to do what you have to do for yourself, right? Like, that's how you grow by consistency. You know, you grow by, you're a year in. You grow when you're 19 years into your podcast. So more specifically, in terms of Go actual ahead. numbers yes. and taking the, what you've done, and yes. now like specifically on the number aspect of it, what do you recommend in terms of taking your platform and kind of skyrocketing numbers? Buy underpriced attention. Whether that's buying ads on Facebook and Snapchat right now because they're underpriced, if that's working with influencers because many are still underpriced, um, whether that's taking the high risk of trying to make a ten to fifty thousand dollar version of what you just saw their incredible video because that one video can be your dollar shave club of your brand saying yes to everything like if you want it if you're hungry you do what I did which is four years ago when I didn't jump into podcasting right away the first two years I just went on everyone's and so I could have went to sleep at 11 p.m. or I could have went on Lewis House's podcast at 11 p.m. Like, that was a decision. It's just about awareness. Like, where are the eyeballs? And so, just put your time and effort into that. Some of it's free, some of it costs money. Thanks. You got it. Hey, Gary. Uh, hey, brother. My first time seeing you, your uh, honesty is so beautiful and it's just wonderful listening to you. Appreciate it, bro. As someone who's trying to like build their brand and yeah. you know get a podcast and get more into Facebook and all these yep. sort of things, Twitter and all this, yep. what are kind of some tips you have for building like a powerhouse team around you to help you accomplish all these things? First, it has to be pra so stay here. First, it has yes. to be practical. So some people in here can afford people, other people can't. So they either have to learn how to do it themselves by spending hours looking at YouTube videos on how to or read, or finding people like we're in an incredible era right now. There are so many kids. 14 to 21 that want to be creators and think it's cool to like do it for free, you know? So you just need to test and learn. Everybody's, guys, everybody's overthinking. Just do. Like, I don't know, post right now, like literally right now, as soon as you sit down, like go on fucking whatever platform has the most, go on all of them and be like, I'm looking for a video and audio intern and see what the fuck happens. Like, again, I always tell people, watch what I do, not what I say. Like, you, you, I know a lot of, you know, there's a good amount of people I see here that follow me. Like, randomly out of no, I fucking tweeted today, does anybody make customizable retail floor mats? I need a, I need a, I need a retail <laughs> floor mat. Like, like, you do? Good. Do you do them for free in exchange for some awareness? You know, so, you know, like, like, I would ask, and then try somebody and be like, you know, like the amount of people I've hired when it was early in something and I didn't know if they were good or bad, 
I just thought it was much smarter to just do it and then figure out if it was working and then I'm like, oh fuck, they sucked. I'm just not scared to waste money or time and everybody's petrified because you worry about what other people think about you. That's why, if you're curious. That's the fucking answer. That's the fucking, see ya. That's the fucking answer. Every, like, your answer's so easy. How do you build a team? Hire some fucking people, bro. <laughs> <laughs> right? But it's like, you know, but you're like, but I don't understand, like, people are scared to get had because they don't get it. Okay, put in a shitload of time to learn the craft or bring someone in and watch what they're doing carefully instead of like outsourcing it and fucking falling asleep because you're all fucking passive income and I got a team doing shit and I fucking, fucking stupid. Got it? Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Gary. Um, hey, Jay. My name is Jay and uh, I run the Inner Change Maker podcast and I want to ask a question that goes a little deeper with what you're saying in terms sure. of sound and sure. watching what you do. Sure. Um, we've noticed that you know, you've launched a couple other podcasts outside of Ask Gary Vee. Within, within, within my experience, mean like the brown paper bags and that brown shit? Brown paper bags, okay. kind of like the, the yes. 365 daily. So it, The 365 you, is an Alexa skill. Right, uh, okay. Briefing, excuse me. So, so I've been doing sub-branding in my podcast yeah. because I'm testing to see if there's traction and I'll spin them out and create new pillars. Okay, so I guess my real question is for content creators yes. that started on like one platform, yes. for example, I started an interview-based show, right? Great. Just kind of like you, yes. know, you have a you know, Q&A show. Yes. Um, if you kind of have that urge to kind of branch out. Do it within the interview show because you have audience there. Yeah. Don't worry that you may lose a couple people. Like right now, as yeah. I'm sure everybody has seen for two strategic reasons, out of nowhere I'm talking a lot more than I should be about wine, right? I'm right. doing it for a reason. There is no question that there's people unfollowing me because they're like, yo bro, I fucking came here to fucking get pumped up because I have no fucking juice. The fuck are you trying to sell me actual juice, right? Like, mm, right, you know, right, like, right. like, <laughs> so, so, but I don't give a fuck because I'm playing a, right. I'm playing a, like a macro game, like I don't want to lose people from it, I'm sad, I don't want to, I don't want to disrespect your attention and, and know what you came for, but I need to test something, right. and this is what I have, and so I think it's better off for you to like try it, because one, you may hit pay dirt, mm. you know, one thing a lot of people don't realize is your numbers look good, but they're disguising the fact that you've plateaued and you're tired, and so I think you try it within it and you take the risk of a little decline mm -hmm. for enormous upside. Because right. you can always go back. Right. Instead of starting a whole new thing that's gonna take energy. Got it? Got it. Cool. Appreciate it. You're, you're welcome. Hey Gary. What about, like your hat, bro. Thank you, appreciate that. My name is Prince. Uh, I want a company called Art of Visuals. We have over a million content creators in 122 countries. You said something earlier about everyone 14 to 22 wants to be a content creator. Uh, I absolutely agree with that and have tons of those people in my community. The problem is with there being so many content creators now, how do these content creators, how do they create a business? How do they make money when By you have better. thousands of people doing it for free, By et cetera? By being, being, being better. Cool. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it, guys, it's supply and demand. And then once there's too much supply, you have to be the best. Right and just move on to the next thing. Like, I bought all the Google AdWords of every wine term for five cents a click the day it started. That was good. Then everybody jumped on, and they started becoming two and three and four dollar words, and it became different. Then I had to be better, then I had to be more crafty, then I had to, then what I started doing is the day the wine spectator would come out with good scores, we would buy that exact wine, that exact vintage. That became our new arbitrage for a year or two before everybody caught up. Do you when, think a, the when a market's mature, you've gotta be better. Do you think it's good enough just to be a content creator? Do you think nope. these content creators need to also have products and other things that they're pushing as well? Besides Look, if you're fucking Steven Spielberg, you probably can end up just being a content creator. But if you're like Sal, you know, maybe you have gotta consider other revenue streams. You know? Right. It's just very basic business. Supply and demand prints, right? Four years ago, there are people that land grabbed. They were good and they were first. It's just real estate. If you were the people that bought Malibu beachfront property first, you won. <laughs> right, boys? You won, you made money. But there's a reason you were the first. It wasn't fucking Malibu yet, Prince. 
And now people who buy Malibu beachfront properties, they're just better. So all those kids that like, they're gonna aspire to be the next this, they've got a rude awakening. They, to be the next this, you've gotta be five times better. It's evolution. When people debate these athletes versus other, these athletes would destroy every athlete from other generations. Because right. they work out 24 seven now. They have data now. It, you know, like it hurts my feelings too that my childhood kid, they would get fucking destroyed. <laughs> LeBron would step on people's heads in the 80s. Like people don't get it. It's just fucking evolution. Cool, thanks Gary. You got it. Great hat. Thanks man. Um, I, I don't really have uh, asked for you. I've listened to no it. I mean, I've watched your stuff a ton. Thanks, Jared. Um, I just want to say thank you for giving me p the permission to pursue my passion and, and now do what I love every day and spend time with my family and make things. Um, and I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say thank you because I don't know if I'll ever see you. If you ever want to play bubble hockey, I'll destroy you. Dude. <laughs> and I know, I know that you say that you... Are you, you filming this? I know that Where you, do you live? Well, first of all. I live here. I, there's a spot right listen, down the street I can listen, take you to play. Listen, listen, that's gonna happen now, I I'm think. A, I'm a winner in Boise, Idaho, Gary. It's so crazy. You, see, you're funny, you're smart, you know me. You know that now I'm getting, like now I'm blacked out and wanna destroy your face. I know. <laughs> but the only, you know what's more interesting though? Your fucking Whalers hat is fucking me up because I'm like, I'm like, fuck man, he's got a Hartford Whalers hat. This team hasn't been in the league for 20 fucking years. He probably is awesome at bubble hockey. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something, for real, based on what you just said. I want you to come to VaynerMedia for a day, I'll pay for your flight in the hotel, and during, <laughs> and, and, during that day, we'll play bubble hockey and we'll see what's up. Uh, hello Gary, um, I first wanna say thank you to both you and Russell. Uh, you two are kinda like, the Jesus of marketing and branding. Um, I come from a poor third world country, Dominican Republic, and if it wasn't for you two, I wouldn't be here. So I thank just wanna man. say thank you. So my question um, right now is like, what are you doing in other languages? Because right now, like, my main language is in Spanish, and I see like a blue ocean. Russell was always talking about blue ocean. He's right. And other languages, ridiculous, the blue ocean that there is, marketing, fitness, whatever, you name it, the ocean's blue. So I wanna know, what are you doing? Because I'm going balls deep into so, Spanish. <laughs> so I, I, what I've been doing over the last six months, I've poured an ungodly amount of money into infrastructure to transcribe all my content into a ton of languages and pay distribution in them. Uh, I'm spending, an enorm I'm going to Singapore, which is my second trip to Asia in the last three months. I'm going to manly, mainland China in January. I'm going to India in February. I'm spending an enormous amount of time and I'll spend millions of dollars next year just on the transcription and distribution of the content that I'm natively making in America in the English language. So, a solid amount. Okay, I just wanna say like influencers, mar influencer marketing in other languages, like it's, it's cheap in English, in Spanish is pennies on the buck, so. It's like, super, cra yeah. I mean, you know, again, cause I just can't, cause I miss them, I haven't seen, like, I remember when Jerome and I, I was like, Jerome, you need to go and figure out who these fucking influencers are in Mexico, because they're like, like even in music right now, mm -hmm. there's so many, like I'm spending a lot, maybe you guys are paying attention because I love hip hop, I'm spending more time with these artists. Like I keep telling them, you know, like you need to go down to South America. There are so many artists there that are really popping. You have the leverage because the brand of America, I mean they're much bigger artists than you, but you're America. So you're automatically bigger than them. Uh, yeah, I mean it's very, I totally agree. Oh, thank you. You got it. Good luck. Gary, Caleb Maddox's dad, I want to thank you personally for your, uh, your impact in his life. Between you and Russell Brunson, seriously, I mean, coming from a dad, I, there's no way I can repay you. Just I appreciate it, man. The, the character that you've taught him. So I thank you for that. I have two-part question. One, uh, you gave him some advice last time you were with him about patience, Australia. and I hear you talk about that a lot. And uh, I want to know as a dad, you know, can you expound a little bit more on that? And then the, I'll, I'll wait till you answer that and I have one more part about that. Right, so you know, it's super fun for some of us in this space, we're literally watching your son grow up and I mean, I just saw him like, fuck dude, you're, you don't look 14 anymore, you know? Like, you know, so you're, and now he's hanging around with all these fuck faces, so he's gonna get into trouble, right? Like, like, he's, like patience is important because, you know, 
he's got more swag now. His sneaker game is stronger. Like he's going into that time of his life where dumb fucking decisions are gonna be made because he's making decisions to make short-term cash because he's trying to arbitrage it for other things in his life. Like why do I preach patience? Because it's the only thing that keeps people away from being straight fucking assholes. Mm. That's good. Thanks. <laughs> I like it. So what did your dad do? You know, you talked about he I didn't, have, I didn't have my dad in my life. Like, I mean, I have my, luckily still have my dad in my life. I didn't know my dad until I started working in the liquor store. Like, my dad left before I woke up and came home after I slept. Like, as a matter of fact, it's probably funny how I feel about you guys. It's fun to watch, you know, because I didn't have that, you know? But what my dad did do for me, ironically, is because I have that kind of salesmanship and charisma, I was completely full of shit. Like, I would be, Everything I make fun of, subtly, I would be if it wasn't for my dad. Because at 14, 15, I went to that liquor store and you would walk into, what, it was called Shoppers Discount Liquors back there. I was 14 years old. I looked nine. You'd walk in and be like, do you have this product? And I'd be like, yeah, that we have, because I was already full sales kid. I'm like, we have that product, but I knew we made more money on this one. I was like, but this one's better. I had it. It was phenomenal. I'm 14. <laughs> People were like, you had it? I'm like, yeah, it's my dad's store. I taste it. I mean. I don't think I, talk about making shit up, I don't think I said a real thing once. <laughs> and, and so my dad took me and he taught me that. My dad thinks embellishing is straight lying and he suffocated me over a three year period that really changed the course of my life. And I think a lot of my success comes from I have all the skill sets of that character but between being you know, old country and really my, really my dad really not allowing me to be that guy. So that's what he did for me. And I think that's what you, if, you know, as a dad, you need to just keep watching him evolve and when he goes into territories that you think are historically incorrect, not new ideas and doing new shit, no, tried and true fucking human dynamics that win and lose, that's how you try to guide it. Yeah, one more if you don't mind. I'm sure a sure. lot of these people probably have kids as well. So like your dad was a powerful businessman and you, you had a lot of ideas and passion as a young age. What did he do to not, like how did he, how did you guys balance that? Was that decision of him making you stop sell baseball cards to come work in the liquor store, was that the right decision? Would you do that for your kids? I'm only asking out of curiosity because when it. I hear that, I'm just very it. curious it's about it. It's a tricky one, man. First of all, we were an insular family. We were an immigrant family. We didn't know shit. There was no internet. Like we didn't know anything. Like. Like, we literally just thought when you turn 14, you go work at the store. We were merchants. Like, right? Like, you know people like that. You know that cliche story. It, just what it was. I was I, it was my 14th birthday. It was fucking time. You know, my D's and F's in school weren't helping me with any compelling reason that I could get out of it. <laughs> so, you know, as far as how we did it, we fucking fought tooth and... I fought for every inch I had. And then I got lucky. What happened was... When I came from college, my dad had saved up a lot of money through these years and started building a dream house for him and my mom, and he took that year off, that was, and he was just not around. And that year, I took the business from three to $10 million in sales, and that was the end of the debate. <laughs> awesome, thank yeah. you, man. Right up here, Gary. Thanks, brother. Hi. Hi, <laughs> my name is Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Uh, I'm really enjoying your speech, so thank, thank you. you. Um, I was wondering, in retrospect, uh, you've built a brand around yourself and your name. Yes. Um, is that what you would recommend looking forward, or rather more of a, a brand around a brand? I think, you, I think you have to do both if you're gonna build it around yourself, because what you're alluding to is you can get pigeonholed and you are live and die by the person. I think a lot of people forget with me, I built Wine Library first. Gary V came later. Mm -hmm. So it's not like I went the Caleb route per se, I didn't come up the game as me, and so I know how to build, I, like, like I'm serious, like, it's a little bit fucked up now, I don't think I can pull it off, but I kind of wanna, actually, you just inspired me, Sarah, I'm literally gonna build a $25 million business in the next three years that nobody knows is mine, just to remind everybody for myself, because I'm weird like that and I need it, like, that I build businesses. Now, let me promise everybody in this room one thing, fame, is the number one arbitrage in our society. Fame is not Snapchat ads, not being the first result on Google, fame. Full brand awareness is the number one arbitrage. So I've built my brand 
as a biz dev machine. Sure. Well, I'm glad I could inspire you. Uh, <laughs> and and it, let me know if you need a goalie on your you bubble it. hockey. I think I could. Got I might. He's amazing. got a whaler's hat. I'm scared. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Hi, Gary. Hey, Rach. <gasps> you have a name tag. Oh, I got so excited. Okay, I'm Rachel. Um, <laughs> wow, that was like cool for a second, and then it wasn't. So I'm the mom of two young daughters. I've got a third on the way. Congrats. And it's awesome. Being a parent is obviously quite challenging as yes. an entrepreneur. You talk a lot about what you were taught through entrepreneurship, through your dad's mistakes and successes, mm -hmm. and you've had a lot of success as an entrepreneur. So for your, you have two kids, right? I do. What are the three main things that you hope that they get out of life, and how are you gonna instill those three principles into them? I, the biggest reason I'm obsessed with entrepreneurship is it's the clearest thing and most obvious thing to me that allows you to do the following, which is, do what you want to do today, right? Like, being, like waking up and being able to do whatever the fuck you wanna do is incredible. So the only thing that I want for my kids like from that standpoint is the ability to do what they wanna do every day. Now, what scares me about that is they're probably gonna have that no matter what because they're gonna inherit extreme wealth. So much so that I've really been having feelings, I used to make fun of Warren Buffett and Bill Gates in my head of like, you're t gonna donate 99% of your money? Until, you know, it's funny, you talk shit until you live shit, right? Now I'm like, fuck, I don't wanna give these kids shit. Fuck them. <laughs> like, because, because rich kids have a huge disadvantage because when I wanted Sega Genesis in 1989, my mom's like, cool, go get it, right? You know, like, when I, you know, when I wanted to go to a Knicks game, I had to sell baseball cards and shit, sit in the fucking, you know, like, fucking top row. Fucking Carmelo's coming over to my Hamptons house to play with Xander. Like, it's fucked up. <laughs> so, I, I don't know what, but here are the things I give a fuck about. Number one, more than anything, and I will kill them, murder, go to jail. They have to be kind. Kindness is the most important. Number two, if I ever see them even inkling, even an innuendo, even a subtle little joke of imposing my and my wife's wealth on somebody else because they think they're part of that, I'll break their fucking neck. <laughs> and then number three, I will not raise them in the political correct environment we live in now. They know there is no such thing as fourth place trophies or participation prizes. So, now, if they want to be nonprofit, you know, look, they're going to look at Daddy's Mountain and they're going to be like, fuck that. Or they may be, do what I do. You know, my dad's things seem big. Mine's going to be a hell of a lot bigger. But, like, other people have made it bigger than me and kids have done this. They're going to look at that and they're going to say, fuck that. I'm going the other way. I'm building schools in Afghanistan. Or they're going to be like, fuck it. I'm going to climb that mountain. I'm going to stick it to Big Mouth. I don't care. I don't need my kids to be entrepreneurs. I just need them to be as lucky as I, my mom, I got D's and F's. Every immigrant got good grades in the 80s. There's a couple of people a little older here, there was no entrepreneurship. School, good school, that was it. My mom spit, spit in the faces of all those parents that made fun of my D's and F's and gave me air cover to be me and it really fucking worked out. Not only for me but the world became it, right? If my kids want to paint in tomato sauce, I will back them to the earth's end as long as that's really why they're doing it, not because they're doing something to like run away from something of that nature. So I'll just blind support as long as they're kind. And the last thing I wanted to say is I'm gonna buy the Minnesota Vikings. So I'll see you Super Bowl? in the owner's club. No, no, no. Super Bowl, Jets, Vikings, 2047. <laughs> I'll see you there. I love this. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Dan. I didn't see you there. What's up, Brian? So my, my question, hey, Dan. My, my question is about time. Time. So you're an angel investor in 100 companies. You have books and an 800-person agency and a family. And there's 
it's unreal to watch how much content you're putting out. How do you choose between the thousands of startup pitches you're getting and the, which, which interview to do or which speaking Conference event to do? Coming. It's just, there's in, just so much. 100% blind belief in my intuition. Because, Dan, you know this, and you and Brandon, you, everyone's hustling, right? Like, eventually you lose, right? Like, eventually time, you don't have enough time to do all the opportunity, so you're crippled by opportunity. You just have to go that route. Otherwise, you're just going to spend all your time thinking about the process of making the best decision, and, is, you know, and you're going to waste being able to do four things, which would have included the two things you've been debating for the last fucking day. So, just the belief in my intuition. And then, and then lots of making fun of yourself. This one's a perfect example. I have to, I have, like, it's, talk about time. My, my son has a birthday now, because he has an August birthday. I didn't realize it was like this Saturday, like, and I think it actually came after we booked this. But like, like all the money and, from this talk is going into the fucking, I was originally gonna go to Seattle, and now I have to take a private plane not to miss the flight. Like, I just fucked it up, and the whole day I'm just complaining deep wrong. I'm like, I'm a fucking idiot. So like, you're not always gonna make it right. Like, you're always gonna like play micro macro, but I think, everybody's saying no. Everybody's saying no to shit because they think they're being thoughtful or they're smart. Like, you know how many people are saying no that aren't even fancy enough to say yes yet? So I just say yes, man, a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Hey. Hello. Hello. Great to meet you. Great to meet you too, bro. I have a two-part name, Frank J. Love it. How are you, Frank? Jay? Very good. Thank good. you, brother. And I, wa I want to appreciate you and your dedication, your consistency, and your communication. Uh, we own a company called International Tribe Design, where we bring a style of communication which is very uh, simple, but yet rare in, in this society, which is honesty and authenticity. And I feel like you embody this. And I feel like a lot of us entrepreneurs, um, well, at least for me, it was like, shall I present myself strategically or sure. authentically? Yeah. And what I want to ask you is the first part of the question, what do you think sells more or influence more people? Authentic honesty or strategic marketing, neuro-linguistic programming communication? I think in the short term, it's a real battle. Mm -hmm. I think either could win. Mm -hmm. I think in the 30-year macro, the radical candor authentic way always wins. Mm -hmm. And what do you, think? you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and the thing that fucks with people is a lot of people can win on strategic, you're being very politically correct, like a lot of people can win on bullshit, play it out for four years, get out of the game with their chips and win. Not a lot of people can though. But then once you know of one of those examples, it sounds exciting because it's a fuckload easier. Mm -hmm. And what do you think the future is for collaboration versus competition? So what we're all about is collaboration. Let's bring us all together. I think we can all do great things as a I think, team. I think both will work, right? Mm -hmm. Like competition matters, right? Like I want to destroy fucking Whaler Hat. I want to kill fucking, <laughs> I, want to, I want to kill Vikings girl. Like, you know, like, like competition matters, right? Uh -huh. Like I'm not gonna, like, like zenning this all out, but I'll tell you, like in real life, Droga 5. Let's just put it even in black and white. Droga 5, David Droga, phenomenal businessman, has an incredible agency. He's gonna get his. Let me tell you one thing that a lot of you are making mistakes because you're saying shit behind people's backs. You can't stop winners from winning. Mm. Winners win. Mm. So something, I don't remember when it became obvious to me, but it's unbelievable. If I see a winner, I'm like, she's a winner. It's binary. Even if she's taking David Droga, winning in my world alongside VaynerMedia, right? I'm pumped. Mm -hmm. I'm happy for him because if you're also a winner, you're gonna always eat. Mm. Winners win. And a lot of people see somebody who's a winner and they're not there yet or they feel like they're taking away from them and they're talking shit. And really all that's doing is exposing where you're at. Like it's unbelievable. When you know, I hang out with a lot of people, you know, like people start yapping a little, I'm like, I'm like, winners win, right? And so unless you're doing something really not noble or things of that nature, winners win. Mm -hmm. And so I think that I collaborate with other winners who take from me. Complex and you know, vice and th these mm -hmm. are win they're gonna win. Yeah. Not, you're not gonna stop a winner and so keep that in mind. I think that's something that does hold back this competitive, driven, hungry demo more than you might realize. Envy is stupid. 
It's just not practical. It just, I just don't spend any time. I'm like, why? I don't know. Awesome. Appreciate you, it, brother. brother. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Hey, Rob. Gary, uh, great to be here with you, man. Seriously, Thanks, uh, lot, it's been about three years since I've been, I, you came across my, my Facebook feed. You were talking to some millennial kid and you just owned him. And, <laughs> and you, just, you just had me hooked uh, for, from that moment. But a uh, couple things. Uh, so you talked about. By the way, about, I, I apologize. I'm, I'm really anti the downplay of like millennial kids. Like, and I don't think that's what you're doing, but I just figured I'd put it on film. Like, like I, I'm 42, there was plenty of lazy losers entitled fuckers when I was 22 too. Like this notion that millennial, like millennials are first and foremost dramatically better human beings than the other generation. It's actually not even close. And you can't be mad at them. The market, this has nothing to do with millennials and over parenting, this has to do with economics. The last nine years have been phenomenal. We haven't had a crash. How many people here are under 29? Raise your hand. You've never tasted the game when it was hard. You've never been punched directly in the fucking mouth yet. You don't wake up like I did in April 2000 and the market collapsed and every invoice and every order is over. You don't know what it feels like when the corporations that want to give you $10,000 for a selfie don't spend money anymore. It gets a little harder to be an influencer when there's no cash in the system. So I'm not mad at millennials. I'm, I'm mad at people's not understanding of why you know, they're awesome human beings because they're far more well-rounded and they just had it good and that's not their fault. We could have had that. I got into the world in New Jersey, 2000, got shit on, 9-11, got shit on, 2007, got shit on. So I've tasted that. So just keep that in mind. And by the way, the reason I told that story is please keep in mind that the economy has been phenomenal for the last nine years. Like a lot of the good is coming for you because of what's happening at a macro level. You're just average. I'm being serious. And I'm not saying that to Raz, I'm saying that be, to make you reflect so that you can step up your game so that when the fucking ravage comes, you don't die. So good, you got a little zing that you're average, but now you can actually stay alive and not go work at fucking, go back to business school. <laughs> Sorry, bro. Didn't know that was gonna take you down that course, but. Uh. <laughs> Um, so you talk about how companies um, are kind of behind the eight ball on on the whole social media, Facebook marketing. It's how it's it's a good value right now. Do you it are is. you starting to see that trend diminish? And, and the, not, when do you see no, you know that be, being not a value Facebook? As soon as math against and art combine to not be valuable, like on television. Meanwhile, Super Bowl is the best ad. Anybody here has got twenty million thrown around? Run a Super Bowl ad this year. The problem is there's seven. It's only seven for the ad, which is phenomenal, but the network makes you buy some other shit. That's where it gets fucked up. But Super Bowl is an incredible value. I don't know, I'm stunned that these big companies that I work with still question its ROI and want to run commercials and billboards. It's, it's so fun to watch them all go out of business over the next 20 years. They deserve it. I can't wait, seriously. Last thing is, is you mentioned political correctness and your, and your kids, which is awesome, and I think that's what everyone loves about you is you just say what's on your mind, and I think we can all take a page out of that book of just being sheer honest. Um, you know, with this crazy climate of you know the whole uh, you know the Google guy that, that that got you know fired from there, yes. the whole ESPN thing, like yeah. wh how do you how do you see this political correctness, and, and what do you do to to mitigate that in your company? <laughs> So, it's a really good question, Rob, and it's a really tough one. Couple things. Number one, I said something the other day that finally articulated how I feel about all of it, which is, I said to a friend, I'm like, fuck, people? So there's only one place in my life where I'm not logical or practical. American football, right? <laughs> like, against all data, I think that, you know, the Patriots are cheaters, and, and Bill Belichick's a terrible guy, and even though Tom Brady's like clearly, and I've like literally spent money on investigative journalism, he's the nicest human being ever, I still say things like, yeah, he left his pregnant wife for Giselle, he's a piece of shit, like I will do anything, blindly, I, I'm, I'm, I have chemical, like even talking right now, the chemicals in my body are different, I feel it, I hate them so much, I, 
I really, I really want Bill Belichick to die. <laughs> like, I don't even, I don't, you, you, you know, it's funny. I wonder if people think like I'm going for, sh- like, I want it. <laughs> so cool, we've established that, right? I'm clearly irrational, over-emotional, not logical, and just the worst version of myself in that one narrow place. If you, I mean, there are people who are fans of me, who've DM me, uh, or have tweeted that I'm a bad, I mean, I yell at children, I'm a, at games, I'm, I'm not joking. You know how people get beer muscles? You know that term? You drink and you wanna fight? I have sports muscles. Like, I go to a game and even though everybody would probably be able to beat me up, I wanna fight you, because it feels better than feeling the pain of your team beating mine, right? <laughs> like a week ago, I realized, holy fuck, that's how blindly everybody is now about politics. You're either red or blue, and you deploy no logic, no rationale, you are blindly emotional, you have no idea what the fuck you're talking about, and that's it. You don't even, we're about to turn every issue into a, how the fuck is climate a political, like, what are we doing here? So, I have a huge office in New York and LA. 84% of my employees are liberals, 84 right? And so I have liberal points of view all day long. The thought of hating anybody or disliking another human being for any reason other than maybe being a patriot is insane to me. (laughs) Insane to me. Insane to me. Um, But I have clearly, you know, Republican point, like an eighth place trophy is why China is going to shit on us with such a big fucking dump that we'll never be able to breathe again. (laughs) How I handle it is by one by one. One by one. It's very hard. You cannot handle this at a macro right now because our society's on tilt. That's how I do it. Thanks, man. I'm so fucking pissed I was born in fucking Russia. I would fucking run, win easy, and fucking dominate. Really would. I'd really feel like I could do it. <laughs> Josh? Gary, I want to it's talk nice about... nice meeting you in the airport, man. Yeah, absolutely, thanks. Um, I want to talk about influencer marketing. Yeah. Uh, YouTubers, vloggers, Instagrammers. A lot of people are talking about Facebook ads, Instagram ads, Snapchat ads, ROI. We can yes. measure ROI yes. with those. Uh, it's you can lot- measure with influencers, too. You can, but it takes a lot longer. No, so it doesn't. How it, so? You've got to make the creative be a sales creative instead of a brand creative. You can't measure the ROI of Facebook either when you do it the way I do it, because I'm pumping it for brand. I'm not trying to sell you shit. I could measure it if I had a $49 course. So how much? Josh, people are confused between branding and selling. Make fucking phenomenal fucking influencers go for the sale and the creative if they choose to and you can afford them. Logan Paul sold a fuckload of Dunkin' Donuts fucking gift cards. Sales, super fucking measurable, Josh. So would you focus, like, let's pretend you're not Gary Vaynerchuk, right? Let's take you out of the equation. You are- Who am I? You are a 41-year-old, 42? 41 still. 41. 41 years. Slow your roll. You're a 41-year-old nobody, right? Yes. You have, say, a million dollars of investors behind you. Well, then you're well, definitely not nobody if you got what, that. But, <laughs> Let's just but, context shit, Joshy. All right, fine, fine. You're <laughs> a 41-year-old nobody. Uh, you're respect, getting respect. Into, yeah, you're getting respect. into the game, right? Yep. Would you focus on growing your personal brand or would you focus on leveraging other people's personal brands that Both. are already thing? So you, would, you, would you ride the backs of using the people that you're building like that you're investing in and sure yeah okay like if you're trying to are you asking let, let's josh uh-huh. what are you asking i'll give you the answer you're trying to build your personal brand i am trying to build my personal brand Thank eventually you. yeah absolutely are you thinking but, about but i want to build my personal brand in a different niche than the influencers that i want to invest in understood i think that as long understand this just because they may be in a different niche, they have so much awareness that the people that watch them may be into other things. Got it? Yep. So if it's a good deal on awareness, you might be able to convert, and then your product has to be good. Cool. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like that's the math you're looking at. You don't have to use the targeted nature of the ads if the influencer's a better deal, even though you might lose 85% of the audience because that's not why they're watching them, but they're still gonna get 15% 15% of opportunity, and then the whole fucking kit and caboodle is, are you good enough? Cool. 
All right, one last question. Um, I, uh, I'm a diehard, diehard Patriots fan. If, if Tom Brady makes it to a Super Bowl this year, will you go to the Super Bowl with me on me? No. No? All right. <laughs> and not only that, I've been to the last six Super Bowls. They've been there two or three times, you know, and I'm now with Vayner Sports and Steve Ross, the owner of the Dolphins, my business partner, so I go, and the owner's dinner, it's all fun. The last two Super Bowls, two of the last three Super Bowls, I left the city Sunday morning. I've not watched the Patriots play a down of a Super Bowl game in the last four Super Bowls that they've played in because I refuse. Everybody's like, the greatest comeback in a Super Bowl? I'm good. I have no idea what the fuck you guys are talking about. I didn't see shit. Well, so, you like winners, and I'd like to invite you to the winning team. No, 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 you Josh, you, Josh, you're confused, my friend. I'm a winner. You root for winners, dick. Yeah, that's true. That's very true. That's very true. Be careful. Thanks, Gary. <laughs> That, by the way, you just witnessed my favorite move, Nick's heat game seven years ago. Dude walks by, beer, remember, sports muscles. Guys, I get up, I'm like, you fucking suck, sit the fuck down. I mean, I get weird. You sit the, he, he looks at me, he goes, yeah, we suck. Look at the scoreboard, asshole. I go, not them, you asshole, you suck. <laughs> by the way, the darkest version of what you just saw, and, jo and Josh knows I love him, but the darkest version, I go to Foxborough for every game, we always get shit on. Around the third, fourth quarter when I'm really getting shit on because I bring my Jets jersey, I'm fucking running in there proper, right? <laughs> Somewhere around the fourth quarter when I'm getting shit on, I change the conversation, I'm like, look, Zan, I'm super pumped that your entire self-esteem is wrapped into your football team because you work at Pizza Hut and so fuck you, my life's better than yours. Maybe your football team's better than mine but I'm better than you, Zan. Jared. Hey, Gary. So, uh, going back a little bit, you talked about intuition, right? And yeah. belief in your intuition. Yes. Uh, I'm a two-day idea guy, right? I get yeah. an idea and then. Me too, man. After two days, I'm like, that was a and crappy idea. And you're being nice, idea. right? You're probably like a seven that you let two, right? More, right, Nicole? Yeah. Like yeah. eight. That like he bothers the fuck out of you, right? Yeah. He's like, what about a drone ice cream company? Yeah. Go ahead. That's a good idea. <laughs> Thanks, brother. <laughs> So how do you develop that intuition and how do you like support and strengthen your belief in your own intuition to by move act, forward? By, by acting on some of them. The biggest problem is, especially when you have like people around you, is like you wanna be right, right? Like it's much better than getting made fun of for being wrong consistently, but like by fucking picking, like just by, I try to do stuff, every, you know, everyone's like, oh, you, you're always in it, like doing, like just trying shit. Like nobody talks about the stuff that I'm doing that, guys, Nobody remembers the part where Michael Jordan couldn't get to the finals because the Pistons were beating him every single time. Isaiah Thomas. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Guys, let me really unleash you doing more shit. Nobody remembers the losses as long as you have a win. And you know, like, listen, some of you know my stuff and like I'm starting to like figure out my own stuff. It comes down to six people your mom, your dad, your siblings, your loved ones, you're doing so much shit based on their points of view on stuff, you can't even imagine. You can unwind that, you're off to the races. It scares me how much I value my wife and parents' opinion and how much I don't at all. And in that balance, I win. On a macro, I value them. But on a micro, my decisions, not at all. You know, Jared, so you just gotta do one or two of them. You go, you go one for seven, it's a lot better than going O for O. Yeah, thank you. you got last, it. Last question. Yeah. Sign it? Yeah, did you sign my book? 100%. <laughs> Hi, let's do it while I'm signing. What's your question, Katie? Hi, Gary, I'm Katie Richardson, and I was first introduced to you as I was trying to go to bed at night, and my husband's got his phone on, and I'm hearing this guy make a rant in a cab, throwing, throwing F-bombs every other word. I'm like, what the heck is this? And turns out, you speak tons of truth, and so you have won over this mother of four who's a business owner, and I love it. And so that's part of what my question to you is, is like, you own who you are, and I love that. And Thank like you. that's what people are so attracted to, right? 100%. You're up there being Gary. At what point, like you talked about how um, 
you work, worked with your dad, and yep. it was a $3 million company, and then you took it to mm -hmm. $10 million after he left. At what point did you like, give yourself permission to be you and then realize, like, tell us that story of when you were like, wow, this is working. People are connecting with me and my way of being. And like, what was that like when you were like, this is working? I feel like- I'm gonna keep the, the, doing this. You know, it's funny. There's, thank you, first of all. There's a lot of things there. Number one, it is 100% because of nature nurture. Being an immigrant and always having a chip on your shoulder, you're always an outcast to begin with at some level. And I was a Russian immigrant, which was our major enemy when I was a kid. So I had some weird shit going on that I don't tell a whole lot because it's not as relevant these days, but there's a lot of parallels to whoever the bad guys are now, I was the bad guy. It was kind of weird for a little while. Number two, my mom. Okay, my mom blindly, like, I remember walking sophomore year in high school, no, freshman year in high school. I'm four foot 11 my freshman year in high school. I spurred it in sophomore year. I'm, I have the worst fucking mullet you've ever seen in your life. I've got a backpack that I'm rolling with that's bigger than me. And I'm walking down the hall and I go, I remember, I remember this vividly, I'm like, wait a minute, I'm not the best looking, awesomest dude in the world? Like my mom had me so brainwashed I'm being serious, on straight positivity, that like, that never went away. Like, my mom, if I opened the door for a woman, like my mom was super smart, I'm doing the same thing. She would make, if I opened the door, I, this, this is a true story, Katie, I opened the door for a woman when I was nine at McDonald's. Let's, that's the story. I went to McDonald's, a woman was coming, I held the door open for her. My mom reacted as if I won the fucking Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> And she did that about all the shit that matters, which is wow. what makes me who I am today. Fourth grade, Katie, fourth grade, I got an F in a science uh, test. I needed to get it signed, because I guess that's how they used to do it. I don't know if they still do that shit. I flushed it down the toilet, <laughs> because my dad hadn't gotten to me yet. And, uh, and, and then, like, I was like, but I was still a kid, so my conscience was still around. And so uh, I just couldn't sleep, and I told my mom, and basically three weeks later, I was sitting in, social studies fourth grade and said, fuck this, I'm out. And from that day on, I decided to fail every class, work on my business skills, and become who I'm gonna be. I love it. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, Gary. Brett. Um, this is my second time oh, seeing you. Sorry. Sorry, Brett. Yeah. I just had a quick ask. I make amazing baby products, and I don't know if you're still having babies or not, but nope. if you need like the awesomest baby gift for a friend, come to me. My company's called Pudge, like Baby Pudge. Send me an email to Gary at VaynerMedia. Okay. In the title, write our entire story. I was the woman with the four kids, and okay. the husband in the bed, and you won me over, and yeah. the Pudge, and this, all of it. Awesome. And then we'll interact. Yeah, I'll make you look amazing as a gift giver. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Brett? So I was gonna say, this is my second time seeing you, and it's funny how a different energy of different audiences, like the first time I went, you were like, you, you even told the audience, I am not excited to be here. I looked at your stuff, it sucks. And, um, and the lady had been like talking about coaching the whole time, and then you're like, don't do it, just do stuff. Anyways, it was awesome, it was in uh, Provo. <laughs> it was just a couple months ago in Provo, but it was funny. Um, but anyways, quick side question was, like do you sense different energy in audiences? 100%. Okay, because it's like, a it's the same I person. Only, I have my religions and my beliefs, then I have my craft, so I'm doing everything state of the art, right? So I have my theses, then I have my work. I was in Seattle yesterday, spent nine hours, understand the voice space a lot, my craft, my craft. So I have my theses, Brett, I have my craft, and my, the reason I'm doing well in speaking is I take my theses, I take my craft, which sometimes has some nuances that are valuable, right? Usually always ahead of the market, and then I reverse engineer the actual audience. I, I reverse engineer the audience. Like, I, I give a lot of thought and speak to the people that organize. Who are you? Where are you in your funnel of life? And like, what can I bring to the most general? And how quick can I get to Q&A so that whatever I miss in the general, we can get to in the details? I totally agree, because it's just a different energy that the, I feel this time versus last time. But my big question is, Please. when you think of like, LeVar Ball, or yes. Kim Kardashian, yes. or any of these, or even Donald Trump for that matter. Like, Hacking culture. Yeah, like what are your thoughts on them, and like, is that the kind of fame you want? Is that the, I mean, you talked about fame being the biggest arbitrage. What are your thoughts on those kind of people? 
so there's a really interesting thing that I believe in, which is until you know somebody, you don't know somebody, right? And so like, look, I mean, polit getting political never works, but like, you know, Trump's got his shtick, right? And the, like, he won on my thesis for the last 10 years, right? Kim Kardashian literally is like, like we are all living in reality TV. People shit on reality TV in Hollywood, then they shit on influencers. They're all gonna pay because if you're not abiding to what the consumer wants, you will always lose. It doesn't matter what you want on your ivory tower. It matters what the world is consuming. Yeah. Um, but I don't, to be very, very, very frank, I don't think about it a whole lot, right? I know why they're winning. They were native. DJ Khaled is an unbelievably important case study in the, in the last 10 years and the next 10 years. His personality was native to a platform at the right time and the right moment and he disproportionately changed his career on that back. Kim Kardashian and Donald Trump navigated reality TV when reality TV was what social media has been for the last four years. Somebody here is gonna get inspired and make a voice application for their business that will be that for when voice is here in two years for the next six years, from 2020 to 2026. It's literally the same game over and over, Brett. So I want, what I want, listen, fame and exposure, you know, like it doesn't change you, it exposes who you are. So I don't know how you personally judge those three and everybody here judges those three differently. I just want to be known for what I am and who I am and how I roll. Appreciate that. Thank you. You got it. Right here. Hey. Hi, hey, Gary. Rach. How are you? Um, I'm here with my amazing husband, Josh, who is like my backbone and amazing business partner. Um, I'm a little googly talking to you because I remember meeting Justin Timberlake when I was 14, but you're like my 32 year old Backstreet Boy. <laughs> Um, he was an sync. I, uh, I love them all, but I love you more. Um, for the past seven years, you've given me the ability to be really authentic. I'm in a niche where it's very club promoting. Okay. It's network marketing. Yep. So I basically, for the last seven years, have sold my soul to direct selling companies, and yep. I made a lot of money yep. and have built an incredible following of network marketers and yes. direct sellers. And now that I've built a great team that's passive and I serve them and I love them, but I really want to branch out into more mainstream impact, um, primarily to female entrepreneurs. And I want to know, what's your recommendation for somebody like me who's had this huge niche, they all expect me to be the prospector, the closer, the lead generator, the team builder, to s now to say, all right, I'm someone if, new, if transition. We had, if, if we had coffee, I'm gonna give you the 90% answer because there's 10% that's too personal, I don't want to do it here. You will ne you have to, I, I have to figure out how mainstream you want to be. I'll buy you coffee. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, uh, Every day. I don't know how mainstream you want to be. So like, if you want to be mainstream like the cover of Forbes and like, like mainstream, like all the way mainstream, you'll have to give up network marketing. Yeah. Completely. Yeah. And I have no problem with whatever God has for me. I just would know if I mean, that's any the, advice. It, it's, it's a stunningly binary answer, Rachel. Correct. If you, know, if you want to go mainstream, you have to give it up because, because it is not stigma. mainstream. What's that? Because of the stigma. A hundred percent. Yeah. And then my last question. And the math around how many people make money in it and how many don't. Correct. Um, my last question is, is there any trends that you see or platforms or any advice that you see with women entrepreneurs primarily my age, 30s, 40s? It's yeah, so the thing, you know, it's funny, Katie, right? Um, yeah. Hey, <laughs> she, hi. Um, Katie said the most important part. I've become unbelievably fascinated and empathetic about the difference between men and women. You know, I'm super fascinated by it from a business standpoint, that's my lens to the world. It's harder to be 100% yourself when you're a woman than a man. I genuinely believe that because men are dick faces, right? And so the answer to your question is to be 100% radically, transparently you. I'm also massively empathetic how that's difficult for everybody, especially attractive women. Awesome. Thank but that's you the so answer. Much. Thank you. You got it. What's up? What's up, man? It's so, good to see you. Uh, How you been? I've been good, man. Good, man. It's good to see you. So four years ago, I was couch surfing and uh, living out of my car, and I sat in a room with Gary, 
and 13 other, 13 other kids, and Gary told us that this app was gonna change our lives forever. <laughs> and uh, it did, and Gary was such a positive change on my life. Now, unfortunately, they deleted the app. What do I do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fuck. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, actually, I just wanted to make that joke, but uh, basically, <laughs> but, um, I, I knew but you what were going you, to... But, but yeah. for a real question, real yeah. question for you, when you run into your failures and yes. you feel like you're at your rock bottom, yes. what's your next move? Because I'm always trying to reinvent myself, Yep. and uh, I'll do things that work, and then I'll do things that don't Curse, work. You, you and some of your, your friends there at the table, you guys have a big advantage, and, and all of you have gone a little bit different with that transition of mine and what happened on Snapchat and, and Instagram and things of that nature. But you have something very special. First of all, you have talent, right? Second of all, you've once tasted what it's like to buy beachfront property in Malibu. Uh, no, I live in an apartment still. <laughs> but yeah, that'd be But nice. you know what I mean? You, yeah, yeah, yeah. AKA, you knew what it meant to your career by being one of the first 40 people that mattered on a platform that became huge, right? right? Yeah. Instead of trying to, what, what you and others that have, by the way, you know why, I wish you could see the goosebumps I have right now. It happened to me. I won Twitter. And then, you know, I, then I wasn't at the top of stuff like I was in that 2006, seven and eight world, you know, right? Why do you think the Vine thing, and this is where I'm going with this, it's, you, basically if you choose to, it's gonna happen again. And let me explain why. The reason I got you guys all together and I flew to LA and met with others of you, like, the reason I did that was, it was black and white. I'm like, I've fucking seen this show before, yeah. right? And like, oh yeah, you said that. You actually said that. You were like saying this is the new YouTube and it, blah, It just blah, was blah. so black and yeah, white. And obviously it took different tacks and the ones that kind of tripled down on Instagram had what ha happened. But you, instead of trying to catch up to what's now, I give you the recommendation that I took myself because I tend to only give advice that I've actually done because it just feels better. You gotta, you gotta either hibernate, make do, grind through, and spend all your time looking for that next one, that is one thousand, you should be downloading, you, you, should be down, you. You should be downloading a top 100 app in the Apple Store that is social or consumer facing every day of your life, creating an account and producing the first piece of content. Okay, I'm gonna do that. Awesome. Thanks, Gary. You got it, brother. Sorry, Gary. Fellow uh, 411 hey, freshman here. I, I love it. You. Uh, really quick question, maybe a little personal. You know we have this engine. All of us in this room have this engine. We can't. Sh we have a hard time shutting off. It's yeah. what makes us successful. How do you how do you balance work and family? How do you do it? Uh, by first and foremost, not adhering to the current state of political correctness that everybody here has deployed on me. <laughs> most of all, right? And second, extremism. I almost took the whole entire month of August off. Like I go all in. Right, I go, when I'm in this, like Monday through Friday, I do not see my kids pretty much at all. 39 weeks of the 52 weeks in a year. Just what it is. And then on weekends and you know, seven weeks, eight weeks of vacation a year, I'm all in the other way. That's how I do it, for me. But that is only uniquely gonna work if me and my partner in crime are aligned on that strategy audit that strategy every day. By the way, I don't even want to do it anymore as now they're eight and five and not five and two. They're just more interesting to be around, you know? So, so like, for example, I guarantee you in 24 more months, this exact trip, they're here and we go to, you know, we go and see the Grand Canyon or something, you know? So like, like you know, I, um, I'm so sad that so many people do certain things in parenting because that's what the other parents think they should be doing. Like, I don't know, like, I just wanna make a very important statement that I implore every parent in this room understands. Everything that is right in parenting right now by the common standards will not be in 20 years. You're gonna be judged one way or the other. So. Cool, thanks. You got it, brother. Gary, over here. Oh, sorry. Hey, Alex. Hey, how are you? Good. Fellow 42-year-old. I think your mom and my mom should hang out, bro, because I think... Similar so, stuff? Same moms, yeah. She sounds amazing. 
And then uh, just want to let you know, like validation on the sound, totally true, because I like literally take a shower with you every morning. So thanks, brother. Dude, like just play it. I got a little shower thing. I listen to your audio. I get it. Gets me going. So thank you. That visual is fucking awesome. <laughs> I didn't even think about you seeing the visual, but now that I think about it, yeah, that could have gone <laughs> Go a different way. Thank you. So I got a two-part question yeah. for you. One is on culture. So um, our, our company has grown, and now we're, we're doing pretty well. And I'm, you've been to like nine figures, and that's where we want to go, right? So my first question is, OK, from a culture standpoint, when you grow rapidly, how do you embed the culture to make sure that it grows with the right people, right? So we Ready? built values, Ready? manifestos. Ready? Ready? Yeah. How do you get muscles by doing push-ups? You do it consistently every day. I spend an ungodly amount of my time on HR. Okay. Like now, I have 800 employees. The biggest thing I'm working on for 2018, so I have an open door policy, which is not working for me. It's real open door, like the key big thing for my two admins and assistants is when an employee asks, they get booked. Whoever, first day, nine years, done. Not working. They think I'm fancy and Gary V, they, they, they're scared, nobody wants to really talk to their CEO. So next year, I'm gonna mandate that I see every one of my employees every six months for 15 minutes, which is gonna eat up big amounts of time. Culture is the only thing you trade on. So you're gonna see all 800 employees, 15 minutes. Yes, a twice a year. Okay. So literally, the you're the taking that one on. I, I the agree. math like, is daunting. When I do the one-on-one -on -one time, it always works, but I'm just thinking that from a scale standpoint. Like, how the heck Scaling do I Scaling the unscalable is how you build long-term wealth. Damn, dude, that's a good one. Thanks, bro. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, didn't, I didn't get up here for my looks. <laughs> now we know why you get paid to stay on up there. Uh, second. My second question was, okay, as you grow, obviously you have things you get, you've got haters, right? I'm sure that people don't like you and whatever. Sure. So I always focus on the mission and the vision and the yeah. people that we're helping, right? But when you get like certain people, I mean, it still affects like me, like when I get those stuff. So how do you overcome that so you can keep growing? Empathy. For them? Yes. And like just their life circumstances or? Sure. If yeah. a human being can generate hate, they're not in a good place. So what do you do mentally and mindset to just keep going? I deploy gratitude that I'm not them. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Thanks, man. Thank you. Hey, man. Hello. Um, so um, I started on Vine as well doing like I remember. comedy. remember. Yeah. <laughs> and now I do it on Instagram, and I grew a large following on there. Very and it's large. Consist yeah. <laughs> and it's still growing a lot, but... I want to be ahead, as you say, and I know I have a lot of meetings about VR yes. and creating content within VR. I'm a very anti-consumer VR guy yeah. in, the, in the timing that I like. Mm -hmm. So everything for me is 24, 36 months, yeah. right? I just don't know how many people are consuming at the scale that you would be giving up opportunity costs in other places okay. in 36 months of VR until I see even one person consistently consuming VR like an hour a week, like if I can find one human who's not a fucking really weird nerd <laughs> who spends yeah. one hour, right? So I think the reason you're feeling that is in, you're in the LA bubble. Mm -hmm. Everybody's pumping a ton of money from venture capital into VR. Yeah, they have And it's budget. literally, I don't, like, I mean, the thing you should study is what happened to the web in 99, 2000, the whole, you've probably seen it, pets.com, all these companies were worth a drillion. Mm -hmm. That's what I feel about VR. It's coming. Amazon's coming, right? eBay's coming. But I think for you and knowing the arbitrage that you can trade on, I don't believe, like if I was talking to you every week, I'd be like, that's not a good place to be spending your energy. Okay. That's my intuition. Yeah. I do think voice is incredible. Mm -hmm. And then I think for you specifically, because I know enough from afar, we don't know each other super well, but I know a lot from afar, mm -hmm. You might want to think about what you want to put that energy into, what bucket. That's why it's good that you're here, right? What I do think these guys do, that's sales and, and quant, like, or if it's you know, a brand or an event, or you're going to be able to push that energy towards something. Mm -hmm. You need to take a step back and get thoughtful with yourself on like what other interests you have or 
you know, that, that wouldn't come natural as the first thing you would think of, like the five or six things you think of health and wellness and lifestyle. It's interesting, it's probably something subtle, putting your energy into building in that world if you wanna really double down on entrepreneurship is a good idea. Okay, cool, thank awesome. you. Awesome, you're welcome. All right, guys, we have time for only three more questions. So we'll go Miles over there, and then we have two here, and that'll be it. Charles, get up there, we'll do four. But you have to stand up. <laughs> I saw your face. All right. Hey, Gary, I'm, hey, a, I'm a big fan of uh, mental models and ways to kind of overcome challenges. Yeah. And I like understanding other people's processes. So yeah. my question to you is, what is your number one business challenge right now, and what is your process to come up with that solution? I'm crippled by opportunity is my number one business problem. And it's similar to what I gave over there. I'm, I'm just attacking it with blind intuition. I, every time me and my team try to attack it from a quant standpoint, it's too foreign, it's moving too fast on us. And so, that's it man. Crippled by opportunity, which is a blessing in a fucking half, as you can imagine, but right. it's the truth, you know? It's the truth. Like, do I say yes to a second season of Planet of the Apps? Do I, like, do I, I mean, the Knicks are for sale. It's like running through my mind, you know? Like, <laughs> like there's just a lot, there's a lot going on, man. I have a lot going on. Right, but I mean, it, other than intuition, I mean, I, I gotta imagine that there's a bottleneck in terms of leverage. There's Where, a, where's the My time, I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, intuition's the solve for the bottleneck, which is making decisions and deploying my energies against those decisions sure. while leaving everything else on the side. Very cool. You know, I decided a year ago, I was raising a $150 million fund, I gave all the money back. I lost, it was the biggest financial loss of my career because I hired the staff and I was gonna pay the staff with the 2%, if you know venture, of you know, the overall fund that I was gonna raise $150 million on. That's a lot of money, 2%. I had a pretty expensive staff. I was going through the process and I'd raised about $80 million and one night I'm flying home and I'm like, I don't believe in this. I don't wanna spend this $150 million on startups. I think there's too much fake shit in the market. I don't know where to deploy it. I think I'm gonna lose it, and I gave it all back. Right? Mm -hmm. That's intuition, thought process, understanding, you know? So I'm just doing that every day. Awesome, thank you. You got it. Hello. Hey, Big Sabrina. Big fan, Thank and, you. but my girlfriend is an even bigger fan and I basically couldn't live down the shame of not asking you a question. <laughs> I love it. So um, I'm a social media manager and I would just love to hear about what you think is the best campaign you've ever ran and why do you qualify it that way? <sighs> Sour Patch Kids candy. We made it a cultural phenomenon because we gave, we took all the money from television commercials, which go figure 12 to 15 year olds don't watch, and we gave it to all the people that sit at that table, or the ones that look like them. We took, in four and a half years ago, we took Sour Patch Kids marketing budget and put it into Snapchat and Instagram when nobody was thinking that way, and if anybody has a nine to 17 year old in their life, they eat Sour Patch Kids. Awesome, thanks so much. You got it. And Sabrina, to answer the question, the reason I quantify it that way was in ha there's been campaigns that we've done that have made more money, have, you know, got, excuse me, made more likes or awareness or more views. You know, he, he stands up here and he goes, thanks to everybody, we have 100,000 views. I already know him enough to know, yeah, and what's, what, <laughs> what's happening with those views. You know, a lot of people in social media, they plan vanity metrics, not sales. The Sour Patch Kids is the answer because we've had campaigns get more, this Budweiser, Derek Jeter and Harry Carey, the stuff we're doing for Budweiser is insane. We've really crushed sales. We're changing a tough brand in the US, but Sour Patch Kids became the fastest growing candy in 20 years. Wow, awesome, thanks so it. much. Over, over here, Gary, real fast. Oh, okay, <laughs> no worries. Hey, hey Linz. Hi. Uh, so I'm a course creator, and yes. I also help entrepreneurs teach better so their okay. students get better results. I'm a little bit at a crossroads. I heard you talking about being in a space that's a little over Saturated. right? And so course creation is a little that, right? Of course. I see, though, the chance to make better teachers, to Good. make their products better. Good. That's one thing. Good. And I think I could do really well there. Great. But I'm also around the opportunity of, I'm a past tenure track professor and I left academia. Okay. And as I was leaving, fellow professors were like, you figured it out, like go. 
I also feel a calling to help professors kind of do what I do. You should definitely do that. So that scares the because, shit out of me. No, 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 I have great news. But this is easier, like helping entrepreneurs is so easy. Okay. No <laughs> shit, Linz. I know. <laughs> but this is back to that Kevin quite like, it, like you gotta decide what you, like, by the way, I have a crazy thing to tell you based on something I've been looking at. Please tell me. The professors are about to become easier. I know. Because they're all about to go out of business. There are, no, it's a sinking ship. Yes, but and the guess, ones guess who what? Know it. This is the thing I wrote about in Crush It. I said all these newspapers and magazines are in deep shit. It's that the writers are going to be better, not worse. They think they're going to be. These professors are about to get the money they deserve. Yes, and and they're Lins, brilliant people. Lins, eat yeah. shit for thirty-six months. Leave money on the table that was easy from the entrepreneurs that are never going to make it, and go help the what's professors. What's my first move? Start. I mean, your first move is to build the business structure. Like, what's the business that you want to do? Do you want to be TED conferences? Do you want to be a course? Do you want to teach one-on-one? -on -one? Do you want to sell a product? I mean, what you need to decide what you I want are. to help them plan an exit strategy and to realize that there's actually money, that there's a lot of professors cool. that could probably make courses really good. That's what you um, should do. Yeah, okay. So charge, like charge them money for your knowledge if that's what you want to do. Okay. And you know you can put that in seven different buckets. Yeah. Right? Thanks. I'm telling you right now, you're walking right into the one of the, what is going to be an enormously large space. And the fact that you were one of them, do you know how much I kill with small businesses? Yeah. Not because it's funny and haha, -ha, it's because I was one of them. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey Gary, I'm Kaylin. Hey Kaylin. This is crazy to like literally be face to face with you right now. So <laughs> thank, thank you so much for answering my question. Sure. Um, one of the reasons that I love you so much and love following you so much is I really resonate with the whole chip on the shoulder thing. Yeah. Um, that's that's what drives everything that I do. I grew up super poor. Like yeah. standing here with all of these people right yeah. now is just insanely surreal. Right. And um, you want to kill them, right? <laughs> I don't want to kill them. I want to oh, like work shit. with all of you. Okay, like just hit me up, please. <laughs> um, but. This thing that's happened is I'm, I feel like an entrepreneur on accident, honestly. Okay. Um, and the thing that I love to do is, is the business that I do that's making me money. But recently I've started being like way more vulnerable about the whole chip on the shoulder thing and like, um, and telling my story. And that's resonating with a lot of people. But that's fucking hard. Like I hate doing that. <laughs> like because I'm very introverted. Yep. I don't like yep. being out there yep. that much. But that's what seems to be making the biggest impact. I have great so, news. What? It's binary. Either you do more of it and you get used to it, and like everything in life, once you get used to it, it just becomes your norm and you didn't realize it. Now, you may never be the most extroverted, but you just expedite. Everybody here can be a better singer, dancer, and basketball player. They may not become LeBron, but if you do it every day, you get better. You keep putting yourself out there every day, you'll get better. So you can either choose to do that, or you could say, I don't like it. I'll leave the money on the table, because I love the privacy and the private life and not having to engage, and you do that. It's your choice. You're in charge. Are you an advocate for doing like what's harder though? If I'm, that's an going to make I'm an advocate. I'm an advocate on doing on doing what you want to do, not because I said so or your friend said so. It's I'm an advocate of you doing what you want to be doing, but I always encourage to taste more, because it works. You know, people here. Do you know how many people here hate oysters but have never had one? <laughs> I think about that shit every day. <laughs> That's how I think about business. Like, you've made a judgment on something, yet you've never done it. So, I'm, you know, you know what I'm gonna say. You know, you've like consumed it. The fact, I mean, I already know you're gonna do more of it because you've already done the hardest part, which is you've done it. You're now a foregone conclusion to me, KP. You're just gonna keep doing I love it. I that you just called me that. You know, like that, <laughs> Thank you. that's what you're gonna do. Okay. You're just looking for me to give you a little more juice to do it a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more, which is amazing. And I'm thrilled to do it because it's fucking free. Here you go, go. Thank you. You're welcome. Just really quickly, is there anything that is hard for you? Like, I know that you're, <laughs> I, like, no, like your mindset, the way that you think about things, you're like, I'm confident, I can do this, but like, is yes. it hard yes. to like get up in the morning sometimes? Or no. Is anything nope. hard it's, at all? Uh, spelling is fucking impossible. <laughs> I can't yeah. read for shit. Uh, if I was reading from a teleprompter right now, I would crumble and be out of here. Can't read for shit. Like, you know, fencing probably is, you know, <laughs> hard. 
oh, I'm, I'm really way below average in swimming, poor swimmer, like always think like, fuck, I'll be super pissed if I like, that's how, if I die because we get fucked up, like somebody hits a, tr- and I have to swim further than everybody, and I'm like, ah, uh, like, yeah, there's shit. Okay. Can I get a photo you know, with you? You know why this? you ask that question? Validation. No, it's the, bec- what, no, why you ask me of that question? Validation, the first part, the second part. You're asking me that as somebody who knows a lot about me because I don't spend any time on it. We all suck at shit. So like, I don't care how you judge mine. You've got shit too. So because I don't care about that, the only reason people spend time on their weaknesses is because it's everybody else's opinion on it that they're trying to avoid. I don't care about your opinion about my weakness because I know you've got them too. So let's just move on. Thank you so much. Can I get a photo with you when you're done? Yes. Thank you. (laughs) Hey, Charles. Hey, Gary. Um, If you ever, I I swim a lot, so if you ever need (laughs) swimming (laughs) lesson. Thanks, bro. (laughs) Let me know. Uh, I'm uh, 37, so I'm not, you know, where you are at age-wise, but, you know, I've been lucky a few times in life, and, you know, I've done well and done not so well and everything, and I have done well. I guess my question is, you know, it's always the concept of the encore, Right, you know, when my one company, you know, I've had uh, eight digit companies before and now I'm launching another one. And I guess it's like, how do you get into it, make bets on it, but feel uh, accomplished if you don't outdo your last time? If because I don't, sense. I do not even remotely think that the financial part is the way I score it. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know what I mean? I mean, that's really simple. Like, outdoing yeah. the last one is. You know, even the way you position, I'm listening to your words, you're positioning mm-hmm. it like, if you're putting pressure on that I need a niner, right? Mm-hmm. Th- then, you're, then you're probably gonna, especially, you know what's funny about positioning a niner when you've had an eighter? It's hard to get going. That's, the, th- that's probably the challenge. I know yes. exactly what's going on with you, Charles. Yeah. And so that's why I'm asking you, are you doing the ambition of a nine or 10 or, cause you see the white space and you're gonna strike like a fucking cobra or, is it because you really just want to fucking do it? So let me give you an example. What I've been doing for the last seven years. I don't love it. Client services, like having a 32-year-old brand manager from the University of Chicago telling me what she should do with Captain Crunch when she can't sell shit, not fun. I'm actually from the UFC, so. Great, yeah. so like not fun for me, <laughs> Yeah. but I know why I'm doing it. I decided at 35, 36 that I was gonna spend 10 years of my prime as a business person, building a death star of communication by eating shit and building a very big business, and then I was gonna point that death star, the Vayner X machine, against the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation because my brother has it and I wanna cure it. Uh, some business that somebody comes along that didn't know how to run it, so I bought it for a million and then I can get it to 100. But I, I realized six, seven years ago, fuck, I now know who I am, let me build the biggest infrastructure in the world around it, and then whether it's to help, you know, hurricane victims or sell sneakers, I'm gonna be able to point this fucking thing. So for me, I don't look at my EBITDA, I don't care how much we're growing, I've made a 20 year decision that I'm in the process of and I'm gonna execute against that. And the numbers and dollars are just not the way I score. If you've been lucky enough to have the success you've had and you're this young, I would take a big step back and try to figure out you know, what is like the most fun or the most macro thesis you can come up with. Great, thanks. You're welcome. Guys, thank you for having me. Thanks. It's awesome. Thank you so much.